Hello there. I think you can see me, and maybe you can't see me yet. Uh, I'll just check uh, with my incredible fancy studio here. Uh, lots of things perched on kitchen uh, tables and whatnot. Oh, yeah, there I am. It's all working. Fantastic. There are people here. This is brilliant. Some people are already quoting uh, the Death of God parable. Uh, Tommy saying, if I could only afford to buy two of Peter's books, which, who sh which two should I buy? Well, you can direct that to me. Uh, you know, there's so much stuff I've got out there free. Just do all of that stuff. And if you actually sign up to my email list, you get a free audio book of the Orthodox Heretics. So do that. But actually, most of my books now will be dirt cheap on Amazon. Uh, you may not be able to get them for a while, but uh, I'm sure there's lots of second-hand copies floating around. Uh, the Divine Magician is probably the one that articulates best, uh, is closest to, you know, my, uh, I don't want to call it mature position, because who knows what I'll think in 10 years, but my, uh, where my work has got to, it's a pinnacle so far of my thinking is kind of in that book, uh, but it's about three years old, so I've been doing a lot more seminars since then, and I should actually write another book. Uh, I kind of keep meaning to, so uh, I've got one that's pretty much finished. It's in my computer, um, so I just need to uh, put the uh, finishing touches onto that. Uh, any other comments before I start? Uh, just various bits and people, bits and pieces, people saying hi, please do chat away in the chat box. And once I finish chatting myself, I'll look and see if I can see any questions. So uh, if you have a question, make sure you put a question mark at the end, because that's probably how I'll see it. I'll just kind of scan down and see if I see any question marks. Um, as some of you know, uh, I've been wanting to do a few more of these kind of YouTube live videos. Some of them will be more like seminars and some of them will be slightly more conversational. Uh, this will probably be somewhere in the middle. Uh, basically, uh, I'm doing Atheism for Lent at the moment. And if you don't know what Atheism for Lent is, it's really just a kind of a, a practice that I do once a year with um, it's a few thousand people usually. And every day of Lent, you get a reflection that is a type of critique of religion. Uh, but those critiques, some of them are from within the religious tradition, some of them are from outside the religious tradition. But we basically explore how atheism and theism are intertwined and interlinked and dance together in a productive way. And um, as part of that, uh, we looked at Nietzsche. So last week we did uh, the great materialist critique. So we did Feuerbach, we did Marx, we did Nietzsche, we did Goldman, and we did a song from Joe Hill. And uh, this morning when I woke up, I was thinking, oh yeah, I wouldn't mind doing something, just looking at the Death of God parable. So the seminar I gave last week on Atheism for Lent looked at all of those thinkers. So in this kind of discussion, I just want to kneel down and look at uh, the Death of God parable of Nietzsche, which is in the gay science. Um, it's a very famous parable. It's probably uh, the parable that the piece of writing that Nietzsche is most famous for. And you know what, I'll, I'll actually just read it in a second so that you have it in your mind. Uh, there's an awful lot to it and uh, there's an awful lot of um, ways that we could take the parable, but I'm just going to focus on a couple of things. Uh, so let me see if I can, I did have it pulled up earlier. Okay, here we go. It goes like this. Have you not heard of that madman who on a bright uh, day lit a lantern, ran into the marketplace and cried incessantly, I seek God, I seek God. As many of those were there who didn't believe in God, they started to laugh. Is he lost, says one? Has your God lost his way like a little child, asked another? Is he hiding? Is he afraid of us? Has he gone on a voyage, emigrated? And thus they yelled and they laughed. The madman jumped into their midst and pierced them with his eyes. Whither is God, he cried, I will tell you. We have killed him, you and I. All of us are his murderers. But how did we do this? How could we drink up the sea? Who gave us the sponge to wipe away the entire horizon? What were we doing when we unchained this earth from its sun? Whither is it moving now? 
Whither are we moving? Away from all suns? Are we not plunging continually backward, sideward, forward in all directions? Is there still any up or down? Are we not straying as through an infinite nothing? Do we not feel the breath of empty space? Has it not become colder? Is not night continually closing in on us? Do we not need to light lanterns in the morning? Do we hear nothing as yet of the noise of the grave diggers who are burying God? Do we smell nothing as yet of the divine decomposition? Gods too decompose. God is dead, God remains dead, and we have killed him. How shall we comfort ourselves, the murderers of all murderers? What was holiest and mightiest of all that the world has yet owned has bled to death under our knives. Who will wipe this blood off us? What water is there for us to cleanse ourselves? What festivals of atonement, what sacred games shall we have to invent? Is it not the greatness of this deed too great for us? Must we ourselves not become gods simply to appear worthy of it? There has never been a greater deed, and whoever is born after us, for the sake of this deed, he will belong to a higher history than all of history hitherto. Here the madman fell silent and looked again at his listeners, and they too were silent and stared at him in astonishment. At last he threw his lantern on the ground, and it broke into pieces and went out. I have come too early, he said. My time is not yet. This tremendous event is still on its way, still wandering. It has not yet reached the ears of men. Lightning and thunder require time. The light of the stars requires time. Deeds, though done, still require time to be seen and heard. This deed is still more distant from them all. It's more distant than the most distant stars. And yet they have done it themselves. It has been related further that on the same day the madman forced his way into several churches and there struck up his requiem. Led out and called to account, he said was said always to have replied only, What after all are these churches now, if they are not the tombs of God? All right, so let's uh, unpack it. Um, obviously we can't do everything but the first thing to notice uh, and it's potentially the most interesting thing is anyone who hasn't heard the parable uh, probably assumes uh, that the death of God would be on the lips of someone who was not religious a humanist or an atheist of some kind and that that humanist or atheist would be communicating to religious people to churchgoers to the people who still went to the temples. But the first dialectic reversal that we see in this parable is it's the other way around. The madman is a religious figure and he is speaking to the, the secularists, the humanists and the atheists of the day. And it's such a, I mean, it's, it's right there, but it's so subtle that you can miss it. Like that is very, very strange. What is this the religious individual jumping into the midst and like, like an Old Testament prophet is proclaiming this death of God and that he's saying it to the ones who don't believe in God. And he's saying to them, you have no idea what's going on. Um, so kind of to, to unpack that a little, uh, Nietzsche himself was a very kind of religious youth and retained a very religious uh, uh, kind of prophetic kind of style and uh, personality all through his life. And at the end of his life, when he was insane, he was signing his name, the Anointed One, the Messiah, right? So there's something about Nietzsche himself that is the madman. I mean, it is interesting. He wrote this, and then in the last 10 years of his life, he went mad. And the story goes that uh, he went mad when he was walking down the street one day, and he saw this horse getting beaten by a man and he ran to the horse and he embraced the horse's head and he kissed the horse and then went mad. And this is a reference 
I mean, it, it may have really happened, it might be apocryphal, but it's reminiscent of a scene in um, Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment when, uh, is it Raskolnikov, I think, but has a dream where he sees a horse being beaten on the streets and he runs up and embraces and kisses the horse and then kind of like wakes up and has this kind of sense of madness. So Nietzsche kind of is foretelling himself to some extent in this parable. You know, he is the madman. He's coming in with this message. And why is this a religious message? Well, one way of understanding it is by looking at the work of uh, Thomas Altizer. Now, Thomas Altizer was a very famous Death of God theologian who was huge in the 1960s and then kind of went into obscurity. And uh, perhaps someday his writings will kind of gain traction again. But for someone like Altizer, uh, who's a Nietzschean, uh, he saw the death of God as a profoundly religious vocation. And this is actually quite common in a variety of thinkers. You see people like Ernst Bloch say something similar. You see Lacan say something similar. But for Altizer, there is something about um, Christianity in particular that is about this type of self-emptying, this symbolic connection with a God who dies, that we are to identify with a type of kind of two types of kenosis. The first kenosis is in the idea of incarnation, God becoming nothing, becoming human, which is a kind of a crazy idea um, from a speculative philosophical perspective. It's a really interesting idea of the, the, the absolute entering into the finite, so the infinite entering into the finite, the eternal entering into the temporal, um, the, um, uh, the essence into the appearance. So th that's a very strange philosophical idea that was actually central to uh, the work of Hegel, who we'll maybe talk about a little bit, right? So Altizer says that when someone says they identify with, with Christ and Christ crucified, what they're doing is they're identifying with a type of canonic self-emptying in which God becomes nothing, identifying with human and then ultimately experiencing a loss of God. So God experiences the separation from God. And this is very, very key for, for Altizer because he, he says, basically says that this is a powerful representation of a deep truth that we see throughout history and throughout the cosmos. So cosmologically, one way of thinking about the universe is that a singularity explodes and in a canonic self-emptying creates space and time and everything that is. So there is a kind of a, a cosmological canonic hymn of the universe. And that hymn is one that uh, creates space and time and everything that is within space and time, right? Right to us. So first of all, we see weirdly at a, at a cosmological level, a type of canonic event. Then you can look as well within history. I'll just take a couple of examples. You can talk about the objective um, death of God uh, in science. And that refers to in like the 17th century, God stopped being um, a, a hypothesis that was required for science. So up until a certain point, God was an hypothesis that helped us understand the objective world. And then the sciences gradually stopped needing God as an hypothesis. And this was very important in the development of the sciences. So even if someone continued to believe in God, as many of the, the scientists of the 17th century did, uh, they no longer used God as a um, hypothesis to understand things. And then you move forward and you can come to like the 19th century and into the beginning of the 20th century, where you can see the growth of a type of existentialism in Europe, especially where God is no longer needed as an hypothesis for our subjective world. So again, there was a point when people, in order to make sense of morality and to make sense of death and to make sense of all of the aspects of what it is to be human, uh, God was the hypothesis that which held it all together. But increasingly, we see an age where people didn't need God as some sort of inner hypothesis to make sense of 
morality and to make sense of meaning and etc and again it's not that people necessarily stop believing in god some will have and some won't have but even the ones who continue to believe in god didn't require god in order to make sense of that subjective world and for for altizer these canonic events that are happening in in the world are kind of bound up in this incredible image of the absolute reality itself emptying and then becoming not at one with its own self entering into a type of uh, 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 what we call an antagonism with itself right and for all ties are far from being a kind of irreligious thing that is the religious vocation par excellence it is to courageously enter into this type of loss of meaning so death of god philosophically means that the death of meaning that which holds your world together which kind of like makes you feel like you know everything makes sense the ground upon which you're standing so this death of god experience he said and this is why he called it the death of god by the way he's referencing uh hegel here he's referencing luther right so there's this actually deeply religious notion to this but obviously the confessional church today doesn't do this right it's not it doesn't believe this but but for someone like Altizer, yeah, that, that is, the madman is the religious individual who enters into doubt, ambiguity, and complexity, goes into what's called the dark night of the soul or the cloud of unknowing and doesn't stop halfway or doesn't run away from it at all, but goes into the pitch darkness, goes into the profane. And the idea is that as you go so deeply into the profane, into the darkness, into the death, you will find light, you will find the sacred, uh, you will find life. Now, this is similar to obviously in a therapeutic setting where you go to the therapist to try to avoid the darkness, to try to get your life working again and to get everything back on track. But then the analyst gradually pushes you into the darkness. They push you into the very place you don't want to go because it's only by going courageously in there uh, that you can begin to find a way of bearing that weight and being freed from it. So we think that we can get freedom by not looking at the truth of our being and the truth of our kind of doubts and our fears and our contradictions. But actually, it's only as we go into those and address them that we find some way of doing it. And in analysis, one of the th things you have to do is there's a certain point when all of the magical thinking and the rituals that you use in order to protect yourself from the experience of the loss of all meaning and a kind of the a type of chaotic dimension to the universe because in all truth the universe is a chaotic place for billions of years the vast majority of it is just coolness darkness nothingness <laughs> and then eventually when things kick off we're talking millions of years of the death of countless trillions of creatures and that's why we've got oil and even in human history most of human history has been full of chaos and darkness death and plagues and, and war and it's only a very small amount of people um, get to the point where you can have a certain amount of time where things aren't completely chaotic and then of course you're you confront the existential dimensions of trauma with that um, i mean think about just life for a second uh, at a certain point some um, very kind of proto life arises and it just exists for a fraction of a second and goes out of existence so life is, you could call life a detour between two deaths, right? So the first detour between two deaths was very short. And maybe that happened a few thousand or million times. And eventually that little detour lasted long enough to reproduce itself. <laughs> and that reproduced itself, that reproduced itself. And now we've got to a point where the detour between two deaths is like 70 or 80 years, which is pretty cool. Um, but it's taken a long time to get to that, right? So. Um, there's a lot of death and destruction and chaos in the universe, but it's also very, very creative, right? Gets to the point where we've got to this, where I can talk to you in a camera and, uh, you know, it's quite impressive technologically where human beings have got to. So, um, 
what was I saying there? Sorry. I'm going, I always lose my way. I kind of go off in tangents. I was saying Altizer, the chaotic self-emptying, the chaos of these. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, uh, is uh, when you go to a therapist, say you want to avoid that and you avoid it by magical thinking and you avoid it by certain rituals. So what that means is, um, uh, well, think about it like this, right? Say you grew up and you're certain about your religious or political beliefs, right? So you grew up in a certain small town and you're just certain that what you believe is correct. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. That's obviously you're going to think like that. This is what your parents say to you. This is the books you've read. This is what the authority figures tell you, right? So you believe it. Uh, but there comes a point when you confront either some questions from outside or some questions from inside. This is a point where maybe you meet somebody and they start to ask about what you believe and they have a different opinion. They have different thoughts. They've maybe read more than you about this and suddenly now you're confronted with the idea that you might be wrong. Now that's a little bit of the experience of the death of God because at this point your meaning system is being shaken. Um, alternatively it could be happening within your mind you start to ask questions of yourself again this starts to cause a certain uh, dis disquiet within you right a certain dis-ease now at this point you've kind of got two options the first option is you go into that now that's difficult and sometimes we're not ready to do that right so we can't be proud if we've done it because sometimes we weren't ready sometimes we're just lucky the environment's correct but there's a certain point when we may say, okay, I'm going to go into those questions. I'm going to start reading a little bit more. I'm going to start questioning what I think. When you start going in that direction, you start to enter into a type of dialectical movement. You start to go deeper into your beliefs and some of them fall to the side. Some of them go in directions you couldn't have imagined, but things begin to kind of rupture and then you kind of begin to move into that doubt and unknowing. The other option is for you to close your ears and go, I'm not listening, right? To, to repress those doubts and that unknowing, right? Now, for someone like Paul Tillich, this is where fundamentalism begins. So fundamentalism isn't certainty. It's repressed uncertainty. You're not a fundamentalist if you just think you're right, right? You may just think you're right because you haven't really encountered a good argument as to why you might not be right, okay? You might uh, just not be in a place where you've thought that much about it. But if you were confronted with legitimate thoughts and legitimate alternatives, you would kind of even be excited about it, even look and go like, wow, I've never thought like that. That's kind of like, that's interesting, right? So fundamentalism starts the moment that you repress the uncertainty. And with the repression of the uncertainty comes uh, certain obsessive practices, which are practices that are designed to psychologically help you, prevent you from encountering the doubts that you have. So there's basically two, well, there's two ways of doing this. So the conservative way is kind of like having the right beliefs. So you, you know, it's the, it's the person who's deeply into apologetics, right? If someone's really into apologetics, like, not all the time, but quite often that's a hint that they're full of doubts, right? Because if they were so confident in what they believe, they wouldn't have to read Josh McDowell all the time and have, you know, all of these books on apologetics. So apologetics can often be the way that within conservative circles, you have to say the right thing. Like technically, you don't have to believe it. You just have to say it. In fact, if you really believe it, uh, it causes problems. Um, so take, for example, uh, I, I knew a woman who was an elder in the church and she was at a group that I was running and it was, it was looking at different readings of different religious ideas and one of them was about the crucifixion and resurrection. And as part of it, uh, people were talking about what they thought about the resurrection and one person said, oh, I don't think it really happened. The other person said, oh, they thought it had. And someone else said, oh, I, I've never really thought about it. But this woman, she said, like, I don't think I believe in a literal resurrection. I think it's a metaphor. And she talked a little bit about that. And then at the end, she seemed visibly distressed. And I talked to her and said, what's, what's wrong? And she went, well, she said, I, um, you know, I said, I'm in the 50s, just going through uh, cancer stuff. And I had a lot of time to think. And she said, you know, I've believed in a literal resurrection all my life. But recently, I've just come to question it. 
She says, but I'm nervous because if I said it in my church, I'd probably be kicked off the eldership team. I'd be allowed to go to the church, but I'd be kicked off the eldership team and I'd be kicked off the worship team, right? And so I said to her, I said, well, is it because uh, is it is it because you have questions about the resurrection or is it because you share it? I.e., do you think any of the other elders have also had those questions? And she was like, well, I suppose they have. And I'm going, okay. So if these other people have some similar questions, then the problem is simply you're not allowed to share them, right? On the surface, we all pretend whenever deep down we kind of know it's not happening, right? Um, there's a... Uh, very quickly, um, by the way, I'm going to take my time on this, so it might go on for a while. You don't have to watch it all in one go. I think it'll be there for a while, so you know, I, I'll, I may wander off at times and come back. But a story that I think captures this, if I can remember it, is um, yeah, during the Troubles in Northern Ireland, the British Army were you know, stationed in Northern Ireland, various small towns, and uh, there was one. A group of uh, the army that were sent to a small town in the middle of nowhere, right? Ballon the Hinch. And they're there and there's nothing to do. And so one night the army officer says, listen lads, let's go down to the local and uh, I'll show you a little trick that you can play on the Irish, right? Show you how stupid they are. Right? So they all go down to the bar, uh, sit down, they order their pints and then the, the, the officer looks around, looks for the drunkest guy in the bar. And he says, this drunk guy, he says, what's your name? He says, oh, it's Seamus. He says, he says, Seamus, he says, come here. And he picks out of his pocket um, a coin, this bright, shiny coin, right? Really shiny, one pound coin. And he places it on the table. And he says, okay, Seamus, there you go. There's a bright coin. And then on the other pocket, he takes out this dirty old crumpled 10 pound note, right? Full of dirt puts it on the, on the table and he says, would you rather have that old dirty note or that bright shiny coin? And Seamus looks for a second and he's trying to focus and he picks up the coin, he bites it in his one good tooth and he's like, here, I'll take the coin, mister. And so he takes the coin, the, the soldiers laugh, right? And they, they keep doing this through the night and eventually they leave and there's this uh, tourist there, this American woman. And she's watching this and surprised. And at the end, she goes up to the Irish guys at the bar and says, do you not know that the 10 pound note is worth 10 times more than the pound coin? And Seamus looks at her and says, of course we do love. But if we took the 10 pound note, they'd stop playing the game, right? So we're not as dumb as we look, right? Now, what I love about that story is they're all playing a game that none of them believe in, but they play it because of the belief in the other, that the other believes it, right? That's not dissimilar to what I'm talking about at the moment, where in an evangelical church, for example, we know the worship team, if it's a mega church, are often just paid musicians who come in and play the music. We know the minister doesn't believe half of what they're saying and has questioned a lot of it, but they pretend to, and the worship team pretends to be all into it. And then the the, the congregation, they all pretend as well. They pretend, uh, you know, put, they put up their hands and think it's all about Jesus and they're, they're totally 100% committed. And everyone's kind of playing this game based on the belief of the other. Um, but if anybody actually exposed the truth of the doubts and the unknowing, the whole thing would kind of collapse. And you've seen that like in whenever an evangelical leader is open about their doubts, often they're kicked out of their church. I've seen that numerous times. So that's a conservative kind of way. But within the progressive and liberal setting, there's a different technique. And that is where you can, you can say all of your doubts. You can have all of your doubts. You can question everything. I don't know if God exists. I don't know if Jesus just is just a man. I think the devil's a good guy, right? Everything's fine. But I'd like to move the altar five feet to the right over my dead body, right? What happens is the structure itself becomes a type of fetish object. Uh, an object that you know is not magical, but you treat it as if it is. It's like the security blanket that a child has. The child holds the security blanket. And as long as they're holding the security blanket, they know they're in a room full of people, but they don't experience the existential terror of being in a room full of people. But when you take away the security blanket, they now experience the existential terror. So the security blanket is not pre uh, preventing them from seeing some sort of truth. It's preventing them from experiencing the truth that they say they have. Okay, so, um, oh yeah, so magical thing, it's just like obsessives. Whenever they 
have to turn the light on and off a certain amount of times or not walk on the cracks or you have to have a certain set of rituals before you go to bed or uh, you have to have the house super clean before you go out or whatever obsessive compulsive disorder that that you have it's a way of kind of type of magical thinking if i it's a controlling thing right it, it protects you from experiencing the chaos of your unconscious so you control your external environment as a protection against the uh the ocean of kind of terror that's there but to come back to what i was why i went off on that tangent when you're in the room of the analyst there comes a point when they say you're going to have to stop doing the rituals so that you can feel the anxiety that they're protecting you from not so that you collapse but so that you can address that anxiety we can look at it and we can move forward so if for example you're using alcohol to medicate your anxiety and that's your ritual eventually the analyst will say to you listen if we're going to make progress here you're going to have to stop drinking and when you stop drinking, things are going to come up, but they have to come up because that's the only way to get over them. So often we use various beliefs that we don't even believe. We just kind of say we believe them or we have certain rituals that we practice, certain magical thinking that allows us to protect ourselves from the experience of the death of God. And what Nietzsche is saying is he is saying that you need to go fully into it. So you, when you experience that moment where your world begins to collapse, don't fall into obviously the apologetics, conservative thing. Don't fall into the fetish object, kind of liberal kind of thing. Um, what you need, and this actually wasn't what I was going to talk about, but, but what was important is what you need are rituals that help you enter into the chaos. Not rituals that protect you from the chaos, but rituals that enable you to walk into it. So one example, and then we'll keep going. One example would be in music. If you're, you've gone through a breakup and things are very, very difficult in your life, um, you could go and listen to pop music, right? Just go put on some like, you know, Indian pop music really loud and forget about things and actually feel really good and say, oh, that person was terrible. I'm better off without them. This is great. Hang out with your friends. Go get drunk at a nightclub, right? That's all fantastic. But the problem is the next day, all of those feelings erupt, right? They come back again. But the alternative is if you listen to a singer songwriter, you stick on some Bob Dylan or, you know, John, uh, Tom Waits or Nick Cave, and you listen to that music, that actually connects you with your suffering. But it connects you with your suffering in a way that you can cope with, in a way that's artistic. They, they kind of carry some of the weight. They lead you very gradually into your suffering and at the end of that you start to feel better so you'll have heard me say this before perhaps but in our contemporary society you've got like two liturgical structures um, that are very contrasting one is pop music getting drunk in a nightclub two is the irish pub right where you have a drink listen to a sad singer songwriter in the corner talking about how his one true beloved died of consumption and he'll never love again and you talk to your mates right they're both kind of they both have the same uh equipment but they're fundamentally different and the nightclub uh is just like getting drunk or taking drugs it's 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 great at the time but then it but it doesn't help you mourn it doesn't help you walk through it's not awake the other is one that helps you enter into the brokenness, enter into the difficulty. And weirdly, you find that the further you go into it, the more freedom you find from it. And so it's a dialectic opposite. If you want to find your life, you have to lose it. So this is what Nietzsche is talking about. And this is what Altizer means. He's a kind of theological Nietzsche. He's going, you go into this every step of the way. You keep going. And so who are the people that the madman is talking to? Well, they're precisely the people who haven't gone all the way. And Nietzsche was very, um, you know, he's very cutting about the humanists of the time, right? And the atheists of the time. Because he said, no, no, no. He says, it's not that you've gone too far into the death of God. You haven't gone far enough at all. You don't know. You, you kind of say that you've kind of lost a sense of overall meaning. You're embracing the doubt, ambiguity of existence and all of that. But he says, but, but you've, you've uh, replaced it with what Shizek would call uh, ersatz absolutes, 
which means you've replaced it with uh, you know psychedelic enlightenment or tantric enlightenment or uh, in perennial philosophies or uh, all sorts of other absolutes or um, other ways to kind of solidify your life or you kind of accept intellectually this death of God, but you haven't experienced the crucifixion, which is what Easter is about, experiencing the, the death of God. In fact, the whole point of the sacrament of the Last Supper is you are unified around a table remembering the death of God, right? So you haven't gone into that space. And so what happens is you create new gods, the secular gods, various ways of money, fame, uh, uh, sex, love, drugs, all of these things that, that you then use as a way to stabilize your life and to avoid a confrontation with the chaos. But he says, but it only works for so long. You, you can only repress it for so long. It returns. The repression always returns. It returns in scapegoating. It returns in violence to people or violence to yourself. It always returns in various ways. And he says, what you really have to do is you have to enter into the religious vocation of the death of God. Now, why is this connected to our contemporary situation? Um, well, you know, I don't want to say too much about that, but it's really, there are genuine things to be concerned about at the moment, and there are genuine things that we need to work through at the moment. But what we have to avoid is anxiety. Now, I'm going to do a seminar on Saturday about anxiety and how to overcome it, etc., etc. So I'm not going to talk too much about anxiety, but Anxiety can be crippling. The difference between a fear, where you're looking at things and you're going, right, how am I going to negotiate with my landlord? How am I going to make sure there's food on the table? How am I going to make sure that there's some money coming in? Um, how am I going to apply for benefits of some kind, right? How am I going to work with friends to be able to maybe share food or to maybe kind of look after each other so that we've got some sort of mechanism, right? These are genuine things that are really important for us to think about now and at other times, right? Anxiety cripples us. It kind of gets us to a point where we get into magical thinking and we do, we do weird behaviors. Now, I don't think the toilet roll thing, for example, is necessarily a type of magical thinking, but you can see that it's becoming for some people a type of like not walking on the cracks, right? You have enough toilet paper and things are okay, right? That's not useful thinking. <laughs> so but what anxiety does is it, it leads you to try to avoid, weirdly, a confrontation with the truth. And you avoid a confrontation with the truth by, by creating certain rituals in your life. Just like putting the duvet cover over your head is that you feel like it's going to protect you from a criminal with a knife, right? It's not, but it weirdly makes you feel better doing it. But maybe if you hear someone downstairs, a better course of action is to, uh, you know, pick up the stick and kind of, I don't know, or pick up the phone and call the police, right? So anxiety uh, and the, the, our inability to kind of enter into the chaos actually leads to behavior that is more damaging in the long run. There's no guarantee that things are going to work out if we're not anxious, but we will tend to make better decisions when we are. And what Nietzsche was saying is that the secular world has not experienced the death of God. They've seen it. He talks about lightning. It's like the lightning has struck, but you haven't heard the thunder in your being. You haven't fully entered into it. Now, I see this all the time in my work. It's one of my great disappointments, actually, is that a lot of my work is, was helping people uh, enter into the antagonisms and the deadlocks within their lives and within their beliefs and to find something positive there. But sometimes people would take that just as a way of deconstructing one religion and then entering another. So they were moving from conversion to one worldview to, to another worldview. When my work is about not necessarily converting from one worldview to another worldview, but from converting to the need to no longer convert. Salvation from salvation, right? Um, now, it means you can't change your perspective, but the idea is that no perspective is going to give you the promise of the, uh, you know, the non-antagonistic utopia, right? Um, again, I've talked about that extensively elsewhere. You can go find stuff on that, so I won't go too deeply into that. 
But what we've we've only done one line of the parable. I'm very sorry, but hey, that's it's a, it's an impo- it's an important line. So what what you have here is the madman who is who is Nietzsche saying that if you can't find a way to kind of embrace the inherent antagonisms and chaos that the universe is. In fact, to say it in an even more stark way, we are the chaos of the universe, right? And we are the chaos of the universe because for Hegel, the philosopher Hegel, it's only because there is an antagonism in reality itself that anything erupts. And think about it in terms of uh, evolution as an example, is that the reason why animals adapt and develop and become more complex is because of an antagonism uh, within biological life and its relationship to itself and to the external world. And that antagonism is exactly what develops complexity. uh, Hegel is kind of making that at a grand philosophical level. He is saying that there's a certain chaos and antagonism that, that brings being out of nothingness, life out of being, consciousness out of life, self-consciousness out of consciousness, reason out of self-consciousness, right? This movement, which is kind of, and we are the eruption of that chaos of the universe. That's why I did a seminar recently, I think it's free out there on YouTube, uh, where I talked about freedom. You know, we talk about, are we free or are we determined? And uh, I think, you know, Sartre at his best understood that the question is not whether I have free acts, but rather that we are freedom. We, human beings are the eruption of a type of non at oneness of the universe, a type of kind of like a chaos that's in the universe. We are the eruption of that. And only if we can make a place for that chaos in our lives can we overcome it. Can we turn it into something wondrous and beautiful? Can we end up affirming life? And far from being an irreligious vocation, this could be the ultimate religious vocation or the religionless vocation of religion, right? And that's what parotheology is about doing that. So again, coming back to the current situation, if you have been able to confront the death of God in your religion and in your politics and whatever way, if you've been able to do that to a certain extent in your life, you will probably find yourself less caught up in the anxieties that are overcoming some people And that will allow you to have a clear head to make difficult and important decisions in this very, very difficult time. Now, the truth is, anxiety is everywhere and you may be feeling anxiety and there are ways to begin to address it. You can't just stop feeling anxious. I hate these things on Twitter, so people say, you know, stop, don't be anxious. Like, you can't just do that. It's a a very difficult work. Um, All I'm trying to do in this conversation is, point you in a direction and the direction is this everything in you everything in you will want to repress the difficulties and the chaos will 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 make you want to back away from it just like whenever you're suffering everything in you will make you just want to like leave all the suffering behind go run off get drunk or whatever it is but actually What we have to do is try to orient ourselves and very gradually start walking into that chaos, allowing space for it in our our being. And the only way of doing that, this is not a courageous kind of like you have to be strong enough to do it. No, you need people around you to help. You need rituals, whether the ritual is once a week you go to the coffee shop with your friends or the poker room and play poker with your your mates or whether it's at the confessional uh, or... It's, uh, it's through reading or it's through listening to music or watching good movies. Uh, I mean, one of the differences between Hollywood movies and in, independent movies are the best independent movies, and there's a lot of crap, but the best independent movies gradually help you encounter the chaos of, of emotional suffering and loss and the chaos of economic suffering and loss in a way that allows you to affirm life in the midst of it. Um, Hollywood at its best also does that, but Hollywood at its worst tends to give you a way to escape it for a couple of hours, just like musicals in the Great Depression were massive because you went to a musical, you forgot about the difficulties for a couple of hours, but then you had to re-enter it. Hollywood at its best 
can also do what independent movies do and do it better <laughs> but they're, they're few and far between those movies um, but finding those places in your life that help you walk into that space because it's you won't be overcome by it when you walk into it that's the feeling you always feel you're going to be overcome by the chaos when you go into it that the death and the darkness is going to destroy you but if you have the right liturgical structure around you you can walk into that and what you find it's beautiful <laughs> what you find is as you walk into it it becomes lighter and lighter and lighter until in the profane you find the sacred right but the more you pull away from it the more you'll find yourself exploding in rage at people uh, doing weird magical acts in order to sleep or in order to feel calm and the the less you'll be able to respond to the current situation so i hope that was kind of a at least an introduction to the death of god parable and at least one element of it which is nietzsche has the religious individual talking to the secular individual saying that the secular individual is actually the one who hasn't experienced the death of God and that that's the religious vocation is, the, is to fully enter into that and that fully entering into the profane is where you find the sacred and the halfway house is where anxieties can erupt and problems can erupt and the truth is to a certain extent we all have to find a way of making peace with the chaos that there is and the chaos that we are not so that we are overcome by it but so that we can overcome it and for another talk we have to do that individually but also politically there is a there is a there is a different what's called mode of production in which we are able to do that and um, that is what i'm hoping will arise not necessarily in the next year but uh, where we're moving towards Okay, I'm gonna to look to see if there's any questions or thoughts. Um, okay, there's loads of stuff here, let me see. Um, huh. Floyd says, I wonder how Peter would react to being called Dr. Rollins. That's the kind of respect that I want, sir. Floyd, very good. No one ever calls me a doctor. <laughs> um, it's funny, but it's see whenever people, this is terrible to say, it's kind of true. When someone calls himself a doctor, um, especially in books, you see a book and they have doctor in front of it, it kind of, it's usually a hint that that doctor is not worth the salt it's written on. Um, did I just mix metaphors there? I think I did. Okay, let me see. Uh, well, there's lots of good conversation going here. Uh, okay, uh, so D.E. Uh, Sacoon, I'm probably saying that wrong, but you said maybe nihilism, I'm, I'm, now I'm guessing this is part of a thread of conversation you've been having, so let's see if I can pick up what you're saying. Maybe nihilism is too strong a, a word. Therapists and shamans from all ages have encouraged breaking down ego to only the essential. All is not loss, uh, so not fatalistic, if you see what I mean. Oh yeah, so you're responding to somebody. But yeah, I like what you're saying. Is It's kind of counterintuitive. It, again, it's a dialectic thing here. It's initially, people think that um, it is... Well, can I tell you another story, right? <laughs> and uh, I think this captures it well. Um, it's a story about... Uh, in Northern Ireland, right, there was a competition on TV. And it's a strange competition, but actually, as a little bit of background, when I grew up, the, what was on prime time TV, like prime time TV on a Saturday, was a show called One Man and His Dog. And One Man and His Dog was a show in which a farmer, one man, and his dog would herd sheep. So he would whistle to the dog and the dog would kind of corral the sheep into a sheep pen. And this was prime time TV. <laughs> and we loved it. You know, you could put on anything, right? So um, this competition was on TV and the competition was who can build uh, the biggest sheep pen with the small amount of materials, right? So there are three people went in for it. There was an architect, an engineer, and then this old farmer, this old guy called Seamus, right? And um, it's all on TV, it's being televised. They've got 24 hours to build their sheep pen. And the architect goes first and she's building away and she's able to build a sheep pen that can fit 50 sheep. It's like, oh, very good, very impressive. Then it's the engineer and uh, he's same material, but he thinks about it for a while. He halves things, he cuts things up differently. He's able to build a sheep pen that can fit 75 sheep. It's like, that's very good. 
And then the TV cameras go over to Seamus. Now Seamus has just been sitting all day in the sun, getting an Irish suntan, which means going red, right? So he's getting his Irish suntan and he completely forgets about what he's doing until it's like half an hour to go. And he's like, oh crap, right, what am I gonna do? So he gets up and he just literally kneels like four small uh, pieces of wood together, right, around him. He's sitting there kneeling it and then painting it, just very tiny, like two feet by two feet. And the judges come along and they they say to Seamus, Seamus, that's tiny. You wouldn't get you wouldn't even get one sheep into that sheep pen. There's no way you're gonna win. And Seamus says, No, he says, No, 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 no. He says, I'm not standing in the sheep pen. You're standing in the sheep pen. Right? In other words, the sheep pen is the entire world, except for that one place that he's standing, right? There you go. So the reason why I'm interested in this is that is the secular critique of the church. Is the secular critique of the church is the church, and by the way, it's the confessional church is this, right? but the church proper, uh, which doesn't really exist, but is um, they think, oh, there's the place where um, the sacred is. That's the place of the sacred. We're in the place where we embrace the profane, right? You, and you've got this little space. And you've got like, the response is, no, 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 you're standing in the sacred. Right? It's actually the, the temple is where you experience the profound death of God, the profane. That's the place where you experience it dramatically. Right? And that's what Nietzsche is saying. He's saying that people in the secular world think they're, they don't believe, but there's so many beliefs in money making, making you whole and complete or going out with the right person, looking the right way, or you go into astrology, astronomy, all these things. When you don't believe in them, but you still go to them. There's all of this weird magical thinking everywhere in the world, right? All this obsessive compulsive behavior, people who have to do rituals before they, they sleep or in order to go out, or all of this stuff is going on. And the, the, what we need is we need a temple of the profane where you so deeply enter into it liturgically that you um, then find the sacred within it. And what you're saying is that actually has resonance among various, they're usually the um, uh, small elements within the religious tradition. You find that, that notion of, of going into the darkness. So it's very interesting. Um, uh, all bards, all great bards wander, Peter. Thank you. <laughs> uh, let's see. Floyd says, oh, here's two questions. Danielle, I think it uh, says, Pete, I was going to ask, when are you doing a live event? Oh, <laughs> but this is good given uh, the ongoing stay-at-home orders in Los Angeles. Oh, when are you doing a live event? Ah, I know. I actually had a live event I was going to do in April and obviously had to cancel that. And sadly, I had to cancel my Wake Festival. Oh, I've done it for eight years in a row. I've never had to cancel. It's been growing. It's my highlight of my year, that and Spark. Um, thankfully, a lot of the Wakers have signed up for Spark. And Spark is in October, so I'm hoping we'll be able to do Spark. Um, should be able to. I'll know in a couple of months for sure. But uh, So no live events, just YouTube lives for a little while. Floyd says... Pete, is there any, Dr. Rollins, right? <laughs> is there any connection between revealing the doubts of the church and being towards death for Dasein? Right, okay, let me see. Is there any connection between revealing the doubts of church and being towards it? Yeah, oh, 100%. Um, so, uh, you know, Floyd's referencing Heidegger here and a very famous book called um, Being in Time. And in Being in Time, Heidegger talks about he, it's interesting, he talks about what it is to, he says like, in order to understand what reality is, you kind of start with yourself because you've got like a privileged access to yourself. So start with yourself and move out, which was like Hegel, start with yourself. And anyway, in that book, he looks at how we are beings towards death. We, death is our ultimate horizon. Whether we look to it or not, kind of we are moving towards it. And uh, Heidegger was very much about going like, realizing this and embracing it is actually not something that will lead to despair it's actually leads to a, a deeper more full type of life um, I always like Gabriel Marcel because Gabriel Marcel added something to this where he said that actually you can come to terms with your own death and not be disturbed by it and because um, Heidegger wants you to be disturbed and Marcel says, no, you, you, you know, you don't necessarily need to be disturbed by your own death. There's actually something far more disturbing. And uh, Gabriel Marcel, one of his jobs during the First World War was to tell parents of the death of their kids who died in the war. 
And he realized that even more disturbing than coming to terms with your own death is coming to terms with the death of the ones that you love. And so Marcel did something very interesting there and a little bit less self-centered, you know, interestingly. Um, but there is, there's lots of similarities. I mean, I'll just bring up the one important one is that for Marcel and for Heidegger, there is a certain admitting the nothingness because death is a lack, right? Death is a lack in nothingness. And it's, there's, lots of, there's two types of nothingness, right? There's nothing that's nothing and nothing that's something. Uh, yeah, no money is a no money. Debt is a nothingness at something. Or the, the nothingness before you were born, it's nothing. The nothingness that you're approaching, that's something, right? You feel it. Or if you're not talking to your partner, you might not be talking to them because you've got nothing to say, so that's silence. Or you might not be talking because you're angry with each other and that silence is speaking volumes, right? So um, this is important, these two types of nothingness. And um, why was I saying that? Well, Heidegger, um, I suppose I was saying that, yes, is that oh, death is a type of nothingness that is something. And it, it can cause us all sorts of anxiety. And for Heidegger, the way to kind of overcome that is to embrace it, to see it, to acknowledge our being towards death. And in the same way, I'm saying acknowledging our doubts, the unknowing, the ambiguity, is a way of um, actually finding a certain uh, confidence, right? Ultimately, by the way, <laughs> um, the, 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 the trajectory of my work here is it's not my first book. People get the impression that I'm saying, let's embrace doubt and unknowing, right? As, as kind of like a, these are negatives. Like, you know, we embrace that we all, none of us know the truth. None of us have a completely the answer. But if you follow my work, you'll see that I'm trying to make a, a different claim. And it's the claim that ultimately the universe itself um, has lack built into it and that our unknowing about the nature of the universe is reflected in the universe itself. And again, I, we can't go into that now, but there's lots of seminars I've given where we look at that, where, for example, what we see in mathematics with uh, Gödel and his incompleteness theorem, or what we see in physics with Niels Bohr and quantum mechanics, uh, are ways of seeing how a type of um, undecidability actually operates within the universe without going kind of new agey with it, just keeping it very scientific. Um, oh yeah, uh, Xavier, is that correct? You, you talked about, yeah, you mentioned, am I talking about commodity fetishes? And yes, commodity fetish is, I um, wonder if that brings us too far. That, yeah, I mean, commodity fetish is a commodity. Uh, Marx uses this term in capital at the beginning in like things, chapter three of capital. There's a very famous section where, where Marx says that commodities, things that are everything that you can, can be bought and sold, um, that has labor in it, uh, are like fetish objects. They're kind of magical. Um, we don't see how they're rooted in work. They're rooted in labor. They're rooted in oppression, right? Whenever I eat my breakfast, it's kind of just magically there. I don't see how millions of people have been involved in getting that breakfast cereal to me from the people who grew the food, the people who uh, uh, pick the food, the people who drive the food to the supermarkets, everyone who's involved in the supermarket system. The object kind of like conceals um, all, all of this stuff. And that's kind of what a fetish does is it conceals um, uh, kind of the truth. Weirdly for Freud, it's different. It conceals what you can see. <laughs> you can see something, but you don't feel it. You can see it. So for example, I, I knew a couple and their son died and they kept his bedroom exactly as it was when he was alive. And that was a, a way for them to avoid confronting fully their suffering. It was so painful. And they kept that room the way it was for years. And eventually they took down the room and when they took down the room they were then confronted with another wave of their suffering but it was at a point where they could cope with it but the room was they knew it wasn't magical but they treated it as if it was it had a mag kind of magical effect it had, it had an effect that um, prevented them from experiencing their full trauma which was a good thing right because the trauma would have been too much too overpowering uh yeah, Xavier says, yeah, they've seen the lightning, but have yet to experience the thunder. I love that image. 
Um, actually, I always thought Nietzsche said it directly. All Nietzsche says is thunder and lightning take time. Um, but maybe elsewhere he said it. He said, you know, the lightning strikes, but the thunder you haven't heard. He also said beautifully earlier, he says, um, after the Buddha died, it's said that the shadow of the Buddha remained on a cave wall for a thousand years. He says we must not simply get rid of God, but also the shadow of God. And for him, humanism was the shadow of God. And this is one of the reasons why I'm not a humanist or progressive. It's, there's, a, there's, there's not enough of the death of God within it. Um, so there's loads of stuff. Well, this is really nice. I'm going to have to do more of this. This is what I wanted, is to do more of these where there's, there's people who come on and actually discuss and ask questions and chat. Uh, let's see. Someone's asking, would anyone recommend reading Camus' The Plague? Um, it is very good. I like Camus. I've got, I've, I've got a soft spot for Camus. Um, there's an interesting critique of Camus that Todd McGowan has in his new book, Emancipation After Hegel. But I think he's a wee bit tough on Camus. I like, I like Camus. Um, uh, Tommy says, is this theme that Nietzsche pushes for entering into the profane for the sacred similar in some odd way to Kierkegaard? call back to, to true Christianity. Yes, absolutely. Um, there's a real similarity in some of what Kierkegaard is doing and what Nietzsche is doing. And uh, they both have a vicious critique of confessional religion. And I mean, I'll have to say, like, uh, you know, the interpretation I was giving to that was very influenced by Altizer, but I do think it's very much within Nietzsche. Um, so yeah, there's lots of similarities between Kierkegaard and, and Nietzsche in this kind of like radical critique. Uh, I could say more about that. I feel like I want to I want to do more. I want to do a course on Kierkegaard at some stage, but I feel like I need to uh, reread a few of his books and also read for the first time a few uh, before I do it. So at some stage, we're gonna I'm gonna delve into him more deeply and do some courses on Patreon. Uh, Okay, uh, D. Uh, uh, Sakun, I'm not sure, but he asked a question. He said, Would you care to speak of the difference between grasping life with the heart and soul instead of the intellect alone? How to not overly intellectualize, if you see what I mean. I absolutely see what you mean. Um, and what I'm doing here, and obviously is intellectualizing, because, well, what else can I do? It's just a talk, right? But the truth is what I'm interested in in this parable, and this is why I spent the first 12 years of what I did uh, doing practice in community. We developed a community called Icon to kind of live this stuff out experientially because that's where the rubber hits the road. It, I think theory is deeply important so as we can understand what we're trying to do and how we work through. So whenever a psychoanalyst spends so long, 20 years get becoming a psychoanalyst, not so that they talk psychoanalysis with the with the analyze and but uh, so that they can know what they're doing within that space and be able to kind of navigate it and work it and so my interest this is why I'm, I'm interested in theology and this is why I do paro theology is it's not just a theory it's a practice the practice is there's two parts of the practice one is transformance art and the other are decentering practices transformance art and decentering practices are the existential movement into what we're talking about. That's vital. I have not done a community uh, since I moved to Los Angeles. And uh, partly because I'm more interested in finding the people who'll run those communities because I can only run one, but if I talk about it and other people run them, I wanna see thousands of these communities, right? So what I'm hopefully doing is encouraging you, maybe you exactly, you DE, whatever your name is, uh, to do this is to encourage you to set up the communities where you can help people enter into this experience because you're absolutely right intellectualizing it talking about it does virtually nothing it can do something but it but it doesn't it's not the act it's not that's why that's why Lacan talks about like understanding is not the importance the important thing in psychoanalysis it's not that you come to understand your symptom you work through it you enter into it, you go through this process. In the same way, yeah, understanding this process is not walking into it. You're exactly right, they're different. And we need spaces that help us walk into it. So maybe I will set something up in LA someday, but ultimately what I'm more interested in doing in the next few years is starting to do live events 
where I find the people who want to run these types of communities, do decentering practices and transformance art, and encourage you to do that. That's my hope. Uh, oh, uh, what was the word for she's X alternative absolutes? Yeah, he talks about it at the beginning of his latest book. I mean, I say latest book, he keeps bringing books out, but um, his uh, Sex in the Field Absolute, which I really like as a book, he talks about uh, ersatz absolutes and ersatz just means um, kind of false or fake absolutes. So he says when you move from kind of like religion, he says what you end up finding is people move into all sorts of things. It's like when G.K. Chesterton says when people stop believing in God, they start believing in anything, right? So you end up, I say I, like people believe in all sorts of bizarre things, especially in Los Angeles, um, that are kind of like uh, replacement absolutes. Uh, Paul Tillich calls them quasi absolutes, which is another good name for it. Uh, all right, thank you so much. I really appreciate that um, people were chatting and engaging, and this has encouraged me to maybe kind of do this more often. So, listen, hope you're doing well. Uh, my big quarantine advice uh, is Colombo, uh, followed by Peep Show, followed by maybe Yes Prime Minister. Uh, a very old British thing. Oh, In the Thick of It is a very good political comedy from the UK. Um, uh, I probably should say wash your hands, but I think we all know that by this time. Um, don't touch your face, which I'm doing continually. And uh, any other ones? Oh, and Hegel. Yeah, and then definitely if you start reading Hegel, you will not see anybody for a while and nobody will want to talk to you. Okay, take care. Bye-bye.